Hey there, so we're just going to be looking at another specific group of animals here. We're going to be talking about what exactly is a reptile, and then a little bit more specifically, what is a tuatara? So when we look at the characteristics for a reptile, again, we're talking about animals that are mostly ectothermic or cold-blooded, ones that can't maintain their own body temperature. They have to go someplace that's warm to get their body temperature up and to get a lot of the energy that they need to function and move around. So you'll find them on all continents except Antarctica. Again, far too cold for them on Antarctica. Um, again, they are tetrapods. They have four feet, tetra, four pod feet, um, for the most part. Or if we see some examples like snakes, which do not have four feet, Again, we have to look a little bit back in the fossil record to talk about the fact that their ancestors did have four feet. Snakes and lizards are pretty darn closely related to one another, so if we look back at the evolutionary history of snakes, we'll see that they're pretty darn close to lizards, which we know have four feet. And we do see some traces of where these feet would have been with um, existing snakes as well. Um, reptiles are adapted for terrestrial life. So life on land, um, they move a lot farther away from bodies of water than amphibians do. That's kind of why this was another big development in the scheme of life. They have what we refer to as impervious skin. Doesn't literally mean like bulletproof or anything like that, but it's pretty darn tough. If we look at the scaly skin of reptiles, it helps protect them in particular from drying out. Um, amphibians have that slimy skin. They need to stay near the water in order to stay hydrated, but Lizards and other types of reptiles can move around in hot areas without losing lots of water. They have nails on their toes, which help them with climbing lots of different surfaces um, and digging as well. They have water-conserving kidneys, so again, they can be farther away from water and enlarged lungs. So those enlarged lungs, again, um, they do negative pressure breathing just like we do. So again, they draw breath in. Um, whenever their lungs kind of expand open. They have those bigger lungs because, again, they're not getting oxygen through their skin the way that amphibians did. Amphibians could do some of that cutaneous respiration, but reptiles cannot do that for the most part. Um, they do shed their skin as they get bigger because that skin is so tough. Um, when they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they just have to get rid of the old skin, um, and they develop new skin underneath it. They all go through internal fertilization. So... Um, whenever reproduction is taking place, a male will um, deposit sperm inside of the female's body for um, babies to develop, basically. So again, when they go through reproduction, um, there's nothing external like we've seen with fish and amphibians. All of it happens within the body of the female. Um, they are all chordates and vertebrates. They have that dorsal nerve cord and they have a backbone to help protect it. And these are also the first vertebrates with amniotic eggs. So you might say, what is an amniotic egg? So we've got this diagram of the amniotic egg here. Don't worry about all of the terms that we have here. I'll kind of focus on the important ones. But again, I'm blocking out a couple here that are not as important. Um, so the amniotic egg is, again, part of this push for getting farther away from the water, closer to the land. Amniotic eggs are what we see with both reptiles and birds that lay eggs, as well as the very small amount of mammals that lay eggs. So... The amniotic egg has membranes that help protect the embryo from desiccation. So when we say desiccation, we mean drying out. Um, fish eggs and amphibian eggs, because they don't have much of a layer to protect them, they just have a thin membrane, they have to stay in water. But a reptile egg is protected from drying out. Again, they've got the shell that helps protect them. The membranes also help cushion the embryo to keep it safe in there. There's our little embryo that's developing inside. The membranes help with gas transfer. So again, even though um, this organism is inside of an egg and developing, there are still gases that exchange through the surface. So if you look very closely on the surface of an egg, like a chicken egg, you might see little tiny holes basically all over, little tiny pores, similar to when we talk about pores in your skin. Um, these pores allow for gas transfer to come in and out of the egg. Um, oxygen can go in, carbon dioxide can come out. So some of these membranes help facilitate with that. And some of them also store waste. Again, the embryo is developing, feeding off the material it has in here, so it has to have some waste processed as well. Like we said, the shell protects the embryo. Again, it's pretty tough, um, as well as preventing it from drying out. The albumin, so this layer that we see all around in here, helps to cushion 
provides moisture and provides food for the embryo. And then the yolk also provides food for the embryo. We see the direct connection here between the yolk and the embryo as it's feeding on that material. So again, this is something that has been um, a big push in the evolutionary history of reptiles as far as the development that was a game changer for them. So when we talk about the evolutionary history of reptiles, we start talking a lot about extinct reptiles. And I put a question mark on here because depending on what type of scientist you talk to, not all of these animals are considered reptiles. Some of them are linked a little bit more to the descendants from their evolutionary history. And um, so some of them are considered to be lumped in more with birds, and some of them are considered to be lumped in more with mammals. And you might be thinking that our pterosaur down here on the right is the one that's the closest relative to birds, but that's incorrect. Um, even though it's capable of flight, pterosaurs as well as ichthyosaurs and elasmosaurs, a lot of our aquatic and flying reptiles are related to the reptiles that we have today to some extent. They've branched off a little bit from it. But when we look at dinosaurs in particular, we start to see the animals that are most closely linked to today's birds, especially theropod dinosaurs like our T-Rex here. So two-legged dinosaurs that were carnivorous, we think that these were a lot of the common ancestors that led um, to modern day birds as we think about them. So a lot of scientists will classify dinosaurs as birds. And then when we look at our dimetrodon up here on the top left, the dimetrodon is part of a group called mammal-like reptiles. So these are the predecessors of mammals. Again, they, they, uh, these animals existed before dinosaurs, um, but their uh, development, as we started looking at their evolutionary history going forward, led to ancestors that had more mammal-like qualities, a lot of what we consider mammals to have today. So again, not all of these animals neatly fit in with um, modern day reptiles, but it's neat to kind of look at their evolutionary history and what types of reptiles are no longer with us on this earth. So now looking at a specific group of reptiles that was around in ancient times but is still with us here today, we will talk about the Tuatara. And again, you might be asking, well, what is the Tuatara? What is a Tuatara? So here is a picture of one. This is a Tuatara. So the order that we're talking about now is Sphenodontia or Rhynchocephalia, depending on where you look up the information. This is all the Tuataras. Sphenodontia means wedge tooth. Rhynchocephalia means beak head. So again, focusing on some of the unique aspects of its head in this case. So these are all of our Tuataras. Tuataras are not lizards. I know structurally they look very similar to lizard. You look at this picture here and you say, well, that's a lizard, clearly. But they do have some qualities that make them different from lizards that we'll talk about a little bit later in this video. But this group is a separate group from lizards. They're a little bit more similar to um, more ancient reptiles. This is part of why we call them living fossils. If we look at their ancient ancestors, um, Tuataras have not changed very much over very many millions of years from their predecessors. They have a lot of the same features. So studying them gives us a little bit of insight into ancient reptiles. They're only found in New Zealand, so these islands that we're looking at here near Australia. So they're only found in one part of the world, and they have a three-chambered heart. So this is similar to most of our reptiles. Their circulatory system involves a three-chambered heart. So as far as one of the first differences we look at between tuatars and lizards, tuatars don't have ear openings. We've got our tuatar here on the left. There is no way for it to pick up tons and tons of sound, so their hearing is not as good compared to lizards. We've got a bearded dragon here on the right. You can see very clearly this ear hole here that um, gives it superior hearing. It's not as good as our ear, but again, this is better than just being completely sealed off like a tuatara, so that's one of the differences. Another difference that we look at, tuataras don't have jaw sockets, and they have two rows of top teeth. Regular lizards only have one row of top teeth. So it's kind of hard to tell here with our skull that we're looking at. This is a tuatara skull. Lizards and us, we have teeth that are embedded into sockets in the jaw. You can kind of tell where a tooth ends and begins as it locks into the jaw. But when we look here at a tuatara jaw, those teeth are just structures on the jaw. They're completely fused to it. So if you look at this video again, when, we, when you look at the presentation as it's um, put in classroom, Click on this link and it talks a little bit about research that has been done with the tuatara for people who have a similar condition. So again, if we think about people who use dentures 
which are essentially um, fixed to themselves. Researching that has kind of helped with development in that line of work. So again, kind of a cool part about how reptile research has helped people. So some other things to consider that are unique about tuatars as far as their lifespan and reproduction. Tuatars live to be about 60 to 100 years old, so very, very long-lived animals. Tuatars have to be 10 to 20 years old to be sexually mature. So that means in order for them to be able to meet with each other, um, go through sexual intercourse, and to have um, kiddos, it takes them 10 to 20 years just to be able to go through the process of reproduction. So quite a long time. Females mate and lay eggs only once every four years. So they don't even have babies that frequently compared to other reptiles. So again, this is part of why um, these animals are in a unique position and it's hard um, for them to keep their numbers up. They are at risk for going extinct and part of it has to do with how slow their reproduction process is. Sex cells with tuatars have to be transferred what we call vent to vent. So again, when we think about the cloaca, that opening that is for getting rid of waste and for delivering sex cells. Um, tuataras do have a cloaca, but males do not have an intermittent organ. Um, other types of reptile males will usually have an organ that helps them deposit sperm in the female by inserting it inside of her cloaca. But with males in the tuataras, they don't have that. So they press the two cloacas together and the males transfer the sperm over into the female to go through reproduction. Temperature of the eggs during incubation determines if the babies are male or female. And we'll see this with a few other reptiles as well, but basically depending on how hot or cold a certain part of the nest is, will determine whether or not that baby develops into a boy or a girl. And then finally, again, if you look at this presentation on Classroom, the image went away there, but um, this YouTube clip, One on Earth is a Tuatara, talks a little bit about um, their history in New Zealand and the threats that they're facing now. So again, because of that slow reproductive rate, um, the island was pretty untouched by people for a long time. But when people came in on boats, they brought rats with them. And with rats, there came a big problem for the tuatars as rats moved into the island and were starting to eat their eggs, making it harder for them to bounce back. So this video talks a little bit about their conservation. So I hope that this video has helped clear up what a reptile is overall, and explain a little bit more about one of our more uh, prehistoric reptiles that is still alive today, hasn't changed much in many millions of years, the Tuatara.